and welcome to episode 38 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today's highlights include a five-quid gig, an arrival in New York City, and the completion of a video. On the 7th of February 1961, the Beatles, with Pete Best on drums, performed for the first time at the Merseyside Civil Service Club in Lower Castle Street, Liverpool. The band received five pounds, about 112 pounds in 2020 money, for this first gig. Another four followed, as we will see in future episodes. In 1962, the Beatles, still featuring Pete Best on drums, performed twice at the Cavern Club in Liverpool, with a lunchtime and an evening appearance in a bill that comprised Jerry and the Pacemakers and Dale Roberts and the Jay Walkers. 1963. The Beatles were at the ABC Cinema in Wakefield tonight, with the Helen Shapiro package tour. The cinema could seat 1,594 people. Perhaps you think that's a considerable crowd. Well, keep that number in mind while we move to a historic moment for the life of the band. And why lie? For the social history of the West, too. On the 7th of February 1964, the Beatles flew to New York City, New York landing at the JFK airport at 1.20 p.m. local time. It was their first memorable trip to the United States, conventionally hailed as the start of the British invasion. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr were accompanied by their manager Brian Epstein, their roadies Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans, and a host of British journalists and photographers. Their plane took off from London in the morning, leaving behind a pandemonium of a thousand screaming fans, and the Fabs landed only to be greeted by five thousand screaming fans, mostly young girls. It was quite a surprise for the Beatles themselves. Despite the great sales of I Want to Hold Your Hand, they believed that they had to work quite hard to really make it in the States. As they stepped out of the plane, they must have suddenly felt that the battle was half won already. Apart from the screaming fans, there were some 200 journalists waiting for the Beatles. It was just the beginning. From the moment they arrived, their every single move was covered, recorded and dissected by countless journalists, photographers, TV and radio crews often following the band live and continuously clamoring for their attention, along with the now usual Beatlemaniacs. Paul, for example, says in the anthology, I remember, for instance, the great moment of getting into the limo and putting on the radio and hearing a running commentary on us. They have just left the airport and are coming towards New York City. Apart from the local press, the Beatles had also bought over a TV crew from England, meant to film their visit with exclusive access to the band and their entourage, for a Granada television special back in the United Kingdom. Albert and David Maisels documented the arrival of the Fabs at the Kennedy Airport, what happened inside the band's suite at the Plaza Hotel, inside their limousine, behind the scene at the Ed Sullivan Show, on the train to Washington DC and in Miami, as well as interviewing fans, showing Epstein in action, talking with DJ Murray Decay of WINS Radio, and so on. The arrival at the plaza was as chaotic as the landing, with hundreds of fans shouting and a massive display of police forces to hold them back. One of the very first obligations of the band in New York was a telephone interview at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 p.m. in London, with BBC's Brian Matthew, presenter of Saturday Club. The interview would be aired afterwards, during the show, and focused on the Beatles' first impressions of the States. Not only Matthew stood up late to record the interview, 
but BBC radio correspondent Malcolm Davis recorded the Beatles' replies in New York, sending the recording over in London later to offer the public an improved audio quality. In addition, Matthew re-recorded his part of the conversation the day afterwards, to complete the sleekest possible product for the audience. All was aired on the 8th of February, in the last section of the show, between 11.50 am and 12 noon, with a Malcolm Davis's piece on the events at the Kennedy Airport and Plaza Hotel, plus the now usual interviews with the fans. The total audience in UK alone was 11 million people, about a fifth of the country. That section of the program was also broadcast abroad by the BBC's General Overseas Service. Throughout the evening, the Beatles received countless visitors in their suite, including George Harrison's sister Louise, who lived in Illinois, the Ronettes, DJ Murray Decay, and others. In 1965, John and Cynthia Lennon, George Martin, and his girlfriend Judy Lockard Smith returned to England from St. Moritz, Switzerland, where they had enjoyed a two-week holiday on the Alps. More filming for the promotional clip of Penny Lane on the 7th of February 1967, with the Beatles back to Knoll Park in Kent. The band was filmed during the late morning and the early afternoon for two final sequences. For the first, they rode horses through an archway through a ruined wall, and for the second, they were at the dinner table where they were served their instruments by servants in wigs. The sequences were completed despite the biting cold. Just take a look at George Harrison in the finished video. Once completed, the clips for Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane were distributed to TV stations around the world. The BBC decided to premiere 1 minute 10 seconds of Penny Lane during the 11th of February show of Jukebox Jury between 5.15 and 5.40 pm. The entire Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever clips were broadcast between 7.30 and 8.00 pm on the 14th of February show of Top of the Pops. In 1969, George Harrison was hospitalized in London for the removal of his tonsils. In 1970, John Lennon and Yoko Ono filmed their appearance in the Simon D. show at the BBC Wembley Studios. They showed up with Michael X, the British Black Power leader. The tape, showing Lennon's and Yoko's new short-haired look, was aired on the 8th of February, between 11.25 pm and 12.15 am. On the same day, George Harrison produced the single Govidna by Radha Krishna Temple. While members of the temple sang, played bells, organ and a flute, George himself played acoustic guitar, Klaus Vormann played bass and Alan White the drums. In addition, musicians from the London Philharmonic Orchestra played harp, tubular bells and strings on an arrangement by Mukunda Das Adkikari. This ends today's episode of What A Fab Day. Please remember to visit www.simonmas.com support and to show any appreciation you might have for this podcast, even by just telling your friends about it or putting a link to it on your social media. In the episode description, apart from the usual link to the bibliography of the show, there is also a link to an 8-minute video summarizing various moments of the Beatles' arrival in New York City in 1964. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.